Welcome to Disciple Dojo. Now, let me just say right off the bat, my throat is a little scratchy today. When the weather swings back and forth pretty wildly, my sinuses just decide that they are going to do whatever they want, which apparently includes playing havoc with my throat in the night while I sleep. But never fear. I've got some nice hot British breakfast tea, which is even better because I'm drinking it out of our Disciple Dojo Old Testament background timeline mug. This is not like a blank plug. You can see I'm literally drinking this. But we do sell these mugs and other, some of the crazy t-shirts you see me wearing from time to time with Hebrew and Greek on them or other designs, other things over in our Disciple Dojo online store. So if you're interested in getting some Bible nerd swag, then check out what we have over there. Anything purchased is just a little way to help support this ministry, but an even bigger way to support this ministry is to click that subscribe button and enable the notifications. That is huge. That helps us grow. Guys, y'all have been amazing. This channel continues to grow exponentially. We're starting to kind of catch some momentum that's just unbelievable, and that is all because of you. So thank you. Those of you that watch Disciple Dojo videos, those of you that subscribe, even those of you that leave obnoxious troll comments, that helps us in the algorithm. So thank you for that. We prefer comments be constructive and insightful, but <laughs> this is YouTube. So what are you going to do? Also, it's fitting that I'm drinking my British breakfast tea because today we're going to be looking at a Bible marketed around the works of one of the most influential Brits of all time. We're going to be taking a look at the C.S. Lewis Bible from HarperCollins. So if you've seen my Bible reviews here, you know I tell people avoid Bibles that have someone's name attached to them. That's just kind of a rule of thumb. You'll never see me recommend like a MacArthur study Bible, a Ryrie study Bible, a Schofield study, any of the, the study Bibles that have somebody's name. Even as a Methodist, I, you, I've reviewed the Wesley study Bible. I don't think it's good. So I generally don't like Bibles with someone's name attached to them, but that is for the purpose of study. When it comes to devotional reading, when it comes to imaginative reading, meditative reading, any of that stuff is anything but study. I'm less a stickler about it. When it comes to historical figures, so somebody alive today, I would never say go buy a study Bible with somebody's name on it if they are still living. I just think there are better resources out there. You know, once they've entered into the annals of church history, it doesn't feel as icky to me. And so somebody like C.S. Lewis obviously would qualify. And I will be candid. C.S. Lewis is my favorite author of all time. Other than scripture, C.S. Lewis's writings have had more of an impact on the way I approach study, theology, imagination, arts, culture, folk tales, myths, superheroes, as you can see behind me, all of that richness that is literary residue of God's creativeness that he has dispersed among creation across all cultures. I think like C.S. Lewis and his buddy J.R.R. Tolkien, that those are fingerprints of God throughout creation, that those are means of common grace. And just like Paul would do at Mars Hill when he observed the monument to the unknown God and used that as a touchstone for bridging the worldviews between his audience in Athens and the gospel he was trying to preach, I think that there's a wealth of that out in the culture if we are astute cultural exegetes. And C.S. Lewis was an incredible cultural exegete. He was not a theologian. He had no degree in theology or biblical studies. He was a professor of literature. His expertise was medieval writings, mythology. And yet he's now considered one of the most influential theological minds of the 20th century. So all of those were reasons that back when this came out, and this came out years ago, it's been updated since. It doesn't probably doesn't look exactly like this now, the newer edition. But that's all the reason that when this came out, I picked up a copy. So I wanted to show you what is in the C.S. Lewis Bible, what it is, what it isn't, and then give you my thoughts on whether or not it's worth it. So this is, I believe, the first edition that came out back in 2010, and it comes with this paper dust jacket, which I'm going to take off. 
it is in the new revised standard version. Now, there was a little bit of controversy when this was announced. The new revised standard version is well known as being a gender inclusive translation. So instead of translating brothers, it'll say brothers and sisters, or instead of saying mankind, you'll have something like humanity or humankind. This is nothing new. This is just how the new revised standard was. But Lewis was pretty open in his we would call it complementarianism. And a lot of Lewis scholars think he would not have been a fan of the New Revised Standard Version and how it handled the text. So I remember that being a little bit of a, I mean, not a controversy, but just in reviews, in early reviews, people were like, eh, Lewis probably wouldn't want this as the translation. He would probably rather it be just the Revised Standard or even the King James, which is what he read. Nevertheless, it was printed by HarperCollins. And so, of course, it's going to be in their translation of choice. Now it says right up front, this is for reading, reflection, and inspiration. That is important to know. This is not a study Bible. So what is it? Well, as we open up, we've got your contents, list of the books of the Bible. This does not include the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books. You get your abbreviations. And then here is the advisory board. So you have the editors and one of the consulting editors was Douglas Gresham. He is, of course, Lewis's stepson. And then all of the advisory board are Lewis scholars or biblical scholars who focus on the writings of Lewis. So, for instance, you'll have Devin Brown. He's a professor of English at Asbury University, and he teaches a class on C.S. Lewis. Or Gary Friesen, professor of Bible at Multnomah Bible College, where he teaches a course on C.S. Lewis. Or Jerry Root, who teaches at Wheaton College and a visiting professor at Biola and Talbot Graduate School, the author of C.S. Lewis and a Problem of Evil and co-editor of The Quotable Lewis, which The Quotable Lewis is a small little uh pocket book, and it is sitting in my guest bathroom so that people have inspiration while they're uh, hanging out on the can. And you also have Michael Ward, Dr. Michael Ward, chaplain at St. Peter's College at Oxford, where Lewis taught. And he's the author of Planet Narnia and the Narnia Code and the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis. Uh, Planet Narnia, I have this on my Audible library. This book is phenomenal. It's uh, all about how Lewis uses the seven heavens medieval imagery and how he's sort of almost coded it into the Narnia Chronicles so that there's an aspect in each of the seven volumes of the seven heavenly bodies of the medieval world. Fascinating book. If you are interested in C.S. Lewis, check out Michael Ward's Planet Narnia. It is so, so good. And it's similar to, and I'll just throw in unrelated, it's similar to what you find in Planets in Peril. So this was by David Dowing, and it's a critical study of Lewis's space trilogy or his ransom trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength. This is the only science fiction that Lewis ever wrote, the space trilogy. If you've seen our Pages from Sages video here on the channel that we did way back, Paralandra is my favorite Lewis novel. And in fact, one of my prized possessions is the first edition American printing of C.S. Lewis's Paralandra. This was bought during wartime. It's got some water damage, sadly, but this was bought by a guy named John Wood who was serving in World War II, July 12th, 1945. And this is the first printing. And what's really cool is it's a, it's a wartime book. So the books that were printed, and I love this slogan. I've act, this is actually incorporated into a Disciple Dojo t-shirt design, books are weapons in the war of ideas. So this is just, I love this. I'm trying to find a replica of the original first printing dust jacket. I can only find one online and the guy wouldn't sell me a digital download so I could have it printed here. And I didn't want to pay, you know, 30 bucks for something that I could just get printed out. That's a facsimile. So if any viewers have a, a replica for the first edition, it would be amazing. But this is one of my favorite possessions and a viewer actually sent me this when he was cleaning out his library, along with a note about the gentleman who bought it during the war, John Wood, and how he was just such a godly church member. And when he passed away, uh, this was in his library. And he knew that this was my favorite of C.S. Lewis's novels. And so he sent it to me. How cool is that? So all that to say, I'm a C.S. Lewis nerd. And in the preface, they answer the question right up front. Why a C.S. Lewis Bible? And so Doug Gresham writes about a lot of what his stepfather, C.S. Lewis, wrote about scripture were uh, in letters, in correspondences, or sprinkled throughout his different works, because he didn't write a lot. I mean, he did write on the Psalms, but he didn't write a lot on scripture itself. 
But that doesn't mean he didn't speak to scripture. He just did it in context of his other works. And so what Gresham says is this Bible, basically you have a wealth of C.S. Lewis scholars who have combed his works and taken these hundreds of observations from specific texts or comments on specific texts or reflections about specific passages, and they've put them alongside those passages in the Bible. And so in the introduction by Jerry Root, talks about C.S. Lewis in the Bible and using Lewis as a guide for Bible reading and then how to read the C.S. Lewis Bible. I like how he says this. He says, imagine if C.S. Lewis were your Oxford tutor or Bible teacher. What would he say? How would he teach and inspire you? He'd ask tough questions. He'd make you wrestle with scripture. He wouldn't let you get off easy. The C.S. Lewis Bible was developed in order to put his wisdom and insight side by side with the scriptures so that readers might benefit from the years Lewis gave to close personal study of the Bible as it informed his own writing. In over 600 readings paired alongside relevant passages in the Bible, C.S. Lewis is offered as a companion and a guide to a reader's daily study of scripture. As you come across one of these readings within the Bible text, imagine Lewis sitting alongside you making observations on Scripture. As Lewis did in his daily study, wrestle with the Scriptures, allow his questions to make you dig deeper in the text to look for answers, and set aside time to pause and reflect. So this is for daily reading, devotional reading. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to read the Bible with C.S. Lewis, that's what they're trying to go for in this. So then there's an essay about the spiritual journey of C.S. Lewis, because he is one of the most famous converts in modern church history. And then there's a quick note on abbreviations and sort of the style of writing that was popular during Lewis's lifetime as opposed to modern English usage. After that, you have the preface to the NRSV by Bruce Metzger, and then we're into the Old Testament. So this is what is in this Bible. Here is the opening of Genesis. And there are a lot of these little reflection boxes. So you have the text of Genesis and then for reflection. And then there's a quote, and it's from his book, Miracles. No philosophical theory, which I have yet come across, is a radical improvement on the words of Genesis that... In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. So you're not getting study notes, but you will get longer reflections as well. So for instance, this is from The Magician's Nephew. This is a passage in the Narnia volume, Magician's Nephew. So the idea is that you read this quote from that work that touches on issues that are brought up by Genesis, and then for reflection, read Genesis 1, 1 through 19. And then the same thing on the next page. There's a passage from A Grief Observed, and then reflect on Genesis 1, 27 as well as a little reflection here at chapter two was just a quote from a letter to Arthur Greaves that he wrote back in 1916. And that's what you have. There are a lot, there are hundreds of them. Most pages have either a little reflection quotation or a excerpt from one of his works. Some of them are longer. And then there are some pages where there's nothing. And so in this case, for instance, the land grant section, Joshua 15 through 17, there are no reflections. Lewis didn't really have much to say about this. Now, when you come to Psalms, because Lewis did write a book all about the Psalms, that's the only book he ever wrote on a biblical text. So you're going to see a number of these throughout the Psalms, but again, not on every one of them and not from his book on the Psalms. Like this one is from Screwtape Letters. And then for reflection, Psalm 31, 15. Now you do have some notes from his reflection on the Psalms and like at Psalm 109 verses 1 through 20. And Lewis was uncomfortable with the imprecatory Psalms. Lewis famously did not think the imprecatory Psalms can be prayed by Christians today. This is one of the issues where despite him being my favorite author and one of my biggest spiritual influences, I disagree with him. I think his conclusion on the Psalms were wrong. I think the imprecatory Psalms do serve a purpose, even for Christians, even in the new covenant. I think they can be prayed with integrity as long as we understand what they are and why they're in scripture. That's why we teach through the Psalms here at Disciple Dojo. So if you follow that series, when they appear, you will see me disagreeing with C.S. Lewis from time to time as we move into those Psalms. But despite his discomfort with those Psalms, his reflections on them are still really good and really profound. He had a way of understanding the human condition. And I think a lot of people that are literary experts have insight into the collective human condition through their literary studies. Lewis was certainly no exception to that. And so even when I find myself disagreeing with him, I still find myself thinking and pondering and being pushed, which is what any good theological or intellectual sparring partner should do for us, whoever we're interacting with. 
whether it's a friend, whether it's somebody we know, whether it's an author who's been dead for many years, whose work still lives on and impacts us. Being pushed, disagreement, all of that can be super helpful and can help form and sharpen our own beliefs. But that's what you're getting in the C.S. Lewis Bible. It's well laid out. There's enough room if you wanted to take notes, if you wanted to write down your own thoughts, if you wanted to respond to some of his thoughts, there's room for that if that's your thing. But it's not made to be a journaling Bible, a note-taking Bible. The pages, I mean, it's a Harper book, so I've come to expect uh, not the best paper quality from them. And this is kind of, you see that bleed through on this. It's not as bad as some of their other stuff, but it's not great. If you are a fan of C.S. Lewis's writings, you will probably enjoy this. If you're not a fan of C.S. Lewis's writings, you will not enjoy this. If you don't know about C.S. Lewis's writings, this might be a good entry into that. I could see this serving that purpose. You'd get sort of a sampling from a number of his works as you're reading through and studying scripture on your own. And lastly, at the end, after Revelation, there's an afterword, and this is by C.S. Lewis. This is his Reflections on Scripture, and it's from his book, Reflections on the Psalms. Then the indices, first of all, you have all of the books by C.S. Lewis. Then you have it indexed by which book they pulled from. So you can see where they're pulling from. They're pulling a lot from his Christian Reflections. They pull heavily from his letters because, like I said, a lot of what C.S. Lewis thought and wrote about scripture was in his letters and correspondences to individual people. And so they have all of the letters that they cite from. They have citations from his English literature of the 16th century book, as well as his experiment in criticism. Lewis was first and foremost a literary scholar. So it's cool that they put some of that in there. The Four Loves, God in the Dock, Great Divorce, Grief Observed, a couple of more of his letters. A lot of them coming from his letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. Tons of excerpts from Mere Christianity, arguably his most famous book, from Miracles. Sadly, there's only one quote from Out of the Silent Planet and two from Paralandra. would like to have seen many more because both of those books have wealth of biblical, imaginative, theologically rich content. A lot from The Problem of Pain, Reflection on the Psalms, Screwtape Letters, Weight of Glory, and then The World's Last Night and other essays. So then after that, they give that same index, but it's by scripture reference. So these are all of what you're going to see referenced in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And pretty much every book of the Bible has at least one excerpt, even if they are smaller books like Haggai, there's still one reflection in that book. But then, of course, like Matthew, there's going to be a lot more, as with the other Gospels. Then at the very end, there's a concordance. This is from the NRSV Concordance by John Kohlenberger, and it's a condensed version. So it's about 30 pages worth of the NRSV Concordance. And that's it. No maps, no charts, no study material, because again, this is not a study Bible. So the only reason I wanted to make this video is so you would know what it is. Some people may think if they pick this up, they're going to get a lot of biblical study insight into the text. No, you're not going to get that. You're going to get musings, thoughts, or writings by C.S. Lewis that are tangentially or sometimes directly related to specific passages, but not in any kind of comprehensive way. This is a devotional Bible. This is, I have this by my bed. It's It sits on the shelf in my nightstand. And sometimes I just want to pull this out and read a couple of Psalms and say, I wonder if, you know, did C.S. Lewis reflect on any of these as I'm reading? And when I come to something that he wrote, I just read it. it. Usually makes me think. It usually encourages me. It challenges me. It inspires me. C.S. Lewis is an incredibly inspiring author. His ability to uh, turn a phrase in English language, his ability to explain vastly abstract theological concepts in very concrete, analogical ways the worlds he's able to build and create, whether it's Narnia, whether it's Paralandra, his grasp of ancient literature and the way he looks for echoes of the, what he calls the, the true myth, the gospel. So I'm a huge C.S. Lewis fan. I still don't know if I would recommend this, honestly. I think if you have his works, you don't really need this as a Bible. I mean, if you want a New Revised Standard Bible, you don't have one, you'd like that translation to have and use, but maybe not as your primary study Bible. Yeah, this would be cool. You'd get some of C.S. Lewis's reflections with it. Like I said at the beginning, if you're a C.S. Lewis fan, you'll probably like this. If you're not a C.S. Lewis fan, you won't like it. 
If you're indifferent to C.S. Lewis, I don't know if this would be worth it, honestly. So I would not steer anybody away from this unless they wanted a study Bible. Then I'd say, no, this is not for you if you're looking for a study Bible. But as a Lewis fan, I'm glad I have it. I think it's great. And I have used it on and off throughout the years. For those of you who aren't familiar with C.S. Lewis, maybe he's one of those names you know of, or he's somebody you know you're supposed to like if you're a Christian, because all Christians are supposed to like C.S. Lewis, but you've never actually read his stuff firsthand, I would absolutely recommend reading anything you can get your hands on by him. Knowing what you're going to read and, and kind of having the proper mindset for it is huge. So if you're going to pick up mere Christianity, you need to know that that was first a series of radio addresses that he was asked to give during World War II by the BBC that went out across the British Isles on BBC radio. That's what that book was. So it wasn't written to be a book. It was written as addresses that then he turned into a book. And that's just his attempt to explain at the broadest possible level what mere Christianity is, not denominations, not Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Episcopalian, Methodist, Lutheran, none of that, just the gospel starting from zero, starting from not believing in God or scripture or anything, and taking the readers through what he believes the gospel to be, what he believes Christianity to be. And it is considered a, a classic in the work of not only apologetics, but in comparative religion. If that doesn't interest you as much, if you're more interested in kind of the psychological, that whole human condition inner working, and maybe satire is more your thing, pick up Screwtape Letters. Screwtape Letters is an imaginary correspondence between a senior demon and his underling, who he's an overseer of, and he imagines hell as sort of this big bureaucracy where everybody reports to somebody who's over them, and so the demons are assigned to humans, and then ultimately they're all under the oversight of who they call their father below. So it's a very satirical point of view writing from an elder demon to his nephew, who's an apprentice demon learning how to torment this guy who is becoming a Christian and how to keep him from becoming a Christian and keep from losing him to the enemy as they talk about. It's delightful. There are audio versions. I think even John Cleese reads one of them. I know Stephen Fry. It's funny that like outspoken atheists even enjoy the screw tape letters and it's because they are a literary classic. So if that's more your thing and you like more kind of dry wit and uh, profound insight into everyday psychological condition, I recommend that. If you want something similar to that, but a bit more imaginative, I recommend The Great Divorce. The Great Divorce is a story of this fictitious bus ride that a guy takes from what is purgatory to heaven and who he encounters along the way. It's not meant to be literal. It's not meant to be making claims about what the afterlife is actually like, but it is making theological claims using the vehicle of this fictitious journey. It's one of my favorite of his writings. The imagination involved in it is incredible. His images of the, the closer you get to heaven, it's not you become less material, but actually you become more material. And there's a really cool scene uh, about people that, well, I don't want to give it all away. It's just, it's great. I love it. If you're into fantasy, obviously the Narnia Chronicles. If you've only seen the movies or maybe some of the cartoon adaptations, forget all that. Pick up the books, read them in the original publication order, not in the order that Harper and others have been publishing them ever since, not the chronological order. In other words, start with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Do not start with The Magician's Nephew. The whole thing is ruined when you put them in the order that modern publishing companies have put them in. I solidly stand on the side of those who say, no, the correct order to read them in is the order that Lewis published them in. And there's reasons why, and I will link to a video in the comment section below that gives the rationale for why they should be read that way. But they're fantastic. They're whimsical. Kids can enjoy them, but the theology in them, like some of the stuff you're going to read in the silver chair or in the final one, the last battle, man, it is some of the deepest eschatology, the deepest theodicy. You are getting high level theology, but you don't even know that's what you're getting because the stories are just super enjoyable. If you've dealt with grief, his two books, The Problem of Pain and A Grief Observed, should absolutely be on your list. He wrote The Problem of Pain uh, earlier in his life, and it was more of an academic understanding of evil and suffering. Then, after he had to watch his wife die of cancer, 
that's when he wrote A Grief Observed. And you're reading in A Grief Observed the raw crying out to God type of faith that you're not going to see in his earlier work. The earlier work was solid and there was academic rigor to it. It was philosophically sound, but the humanity and the pathos comes through in a grief observed. And if you've ever dealt with any kind of depression, ailments, sickness, suffering, mental illness, any of that kind of stuff, read a grief observed. You will at least feel like I'm not alone. Somebody gets it. His novel, Till We Have Faces, is some of my friends say that's their favorite of his works. You might can make the case it's the most literarily sophisticated. But as I said earlier, my favorite writings of his are the Space Trilogy, particularly the first two, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra. The third one kind of veers into a different direction. I, it's still great. I, I do still think it's very good. But I think the first two are on another level. What made the first two great are not in the third one, but the third one is good. I, I'm not bashing it. But yeah, Paralandra, easily my favorite of all of C.S. Lewis's works. So this is a video just for fellow C.S. Lewis nerds out there. He's one of those thinkers. Should you agree with everything he said? No. Should you take everything he says as scripture? No. Did, was he wrong on some things? Yes. But was he a heretic, as you'll hear some fundamentalists claim? No, absolutely not. And, and people who make that claim, it, it tells me all I need to know about someone if they come out saying C.S. Lewis is a heretic, C.S. Lewis is a false teacher. I'm like, OK, I, you, you don't have sound judgment uh, in, in my eyes. So that's different than somebody saying Lewis was a phenomenally gifted author. Uh, he was a brilliant writer, but I think he had some deeply problematic views on X, Y, Z. That's fine. That's a fair critique. And I think you could say that about pretty much everybody in church history. So people that think he's a saint and can do no wrong, that's not healthy. People think he's a heretic and should be condemned. That's certainly not healthy. But in between that, there's a wide range of approaches and responses that Christians have had to C.S. Lewis. I am in the camp of he is arguably the most inspiring author for me to read in the history of the English language. That's where I land, regardless of theological differences. But I know that's not everybody, and everybody's different. So anyway, that's all for now. I just wanted to share a little bit about this particular Bible in case you were wondering what it is if you see it on the shelf and are thinking about picking it up. Now you know. I hope this review is helpful. As always, appreciate it. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. Hit the subscribe button, enable notifications, leave a comment telling me what's your favorite C.S. Lewis work? What are your thoughts on C.S. Lewis? What should I have mentioned that he wrote that I didn't mention? Feel free to leave any of your feedback in the comments below. We always love hearing from viewers. That's all for now. We'll be back next time here at Disciple Dojo for another Bible review. As always, keep training. Cheers.